Hey, revolutionaries. I can't wait to get to this week's episode with Tom Moulier, where we talk about how he's using technology to get people connected back to nature, actually, and disconnected from technology. So it's a great episode. I can't wait to get to it. But first, I have a question for everybody out there. It's 2018. We're only a few days into the into the new year. And I want to know, what are you doing already to reinvent yourself? What have you changed? How are you thinking differently? What are you doing already? The time is now. It's time for action. Hopefully, you're listening to the podcast. That's one thing you're doing already. And if you are, and if you're digging it, you know, share it with someone else. That's another thing you can do is, you know, share it with someone else and you might be helping someone else. And that's always a good feeling. Okay. 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 So having said that, I know you're thinking, uh, whatever, Jim, Jim, you know, I'm listening to the show, but, but what are you doing already? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a good question too. And I'm doing two things actually. So I, I, I joined a gym recently. So I've been going the last week. I joined it uh, before the new year. And I hadn't joined, I hadn't had a gym to go to in a while. I'd let my other membership go about a year and a half ago, but I'm getting back into it. And I joined a super luxe gym this time around, uh, just kind of to get myself back into it, get myself motivated. And it's got the full sauna and steam room and sw- indoor swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool, full weights classes, all that kind of stuff. So it's really been great. And this afternoon or this evening, I think I'm going and I'm going to work on the uh, lower half of the body. So leg presses, squats, all that kind of good stuff. So that's one thing I'm doing. Got back into that. Second thing I've been doing is I've been booking travel and uh, FYI out there. So I'm going to be going to the Blockchain Technology Evolution in the U.S. and China Conference. It's a one-day program in San Francisco coming up here at the end of the month. I think it's January 26th. So that's another thing I'm doing is getting out there, uh, traveling and interacting with other folks that are, are you know trying to figure out what's happening in the world, technically speaking, and what the implications are really for the greater, uh, you know, financial system and, and for trade in the economy. And I thought this was a good one because it focuses on China and Asia a little bit. And I'm also looking at booking a trip to Asia starting probably middle of February, and I'll be probably going to flow through Japan for a few days and then in uh, Thailand, Southeast Asia for a few weeks uh, through middle end of March. So, Getting back in shape and and booking some travel. So those are two things I'm doing already. And those of you who are interested, who are on the email list, I'll put the uh, details of those uh, travels and the conference information in uh, my update that should be coming out. Sorry, I missed December. Also, I may go to PodFest in Orlando, and I'll put information in the email about that as well. And a third thing that I intend to do more of this year is get back to the outdoors, get back in touch with nature. And that brings us to this week's episode with Tom Moulier. Tom recently made the decision to leave the corporate world and turn his passion into a business, and he founded a company called iTruckers, where he connects and educates people that are interested in outdoor experiences. So here's the episode. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, the show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, visit JimJimsReinventionRevolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. Hi, everybody. Hey, this is Jim Jim, and welcome to episode 19 of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And I'm talking today with Tom Moulier, who's the visionary founder of iTrackers where he's leveraging technology to get us all away from technology, uh, which I love this idea, to get us back outdoors, back into nature. So I can't wait to get started. Tom, welcome to the revolution. Hey, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks for uh, you know taking time out of your day. And I can't wait to talk to you again because in just getting to know you, you really just got, got me turned on to this is a part of you know the reinvention revolution that we all need is finding a way to you know, take a time out from technology, right? And uh, that's the business that you got into. So tell me about iTruckers and kind of why you got started with it and how, how long you've been doing it, where you're at with it right now, because it's a kind of a recent thing that you dove into. Yeah, so iTruckers is an outdoor adventure company. And the reason for the creation of iTruckers was simple. I found it difficult to get outdoors with professional guides, uh, you know, no matter where I went. 
Um, mm. And I know what I'm doing and I know what to look for, for the types of trips and uh, adventures that I'm interested in, which, you know, fishing, camping, hiking, paddle adventures. Right. And it was really hard to, to, to find quality guides and to be able to make the right choices. So in its original form, iTrekkers was a way to basically create a tech platform that would connect consumers to independent vetted outdoor guides to provide amazing private experiences to individuals and families, friends, coworkers, et cetera. I see. And that's how we started the, the company originally when we launched in December of 2014. Um, and since then, it's been a roller coaster ride of uh, learning after learning, failure after failure, success. <laughs> right. Um, up to today, our, our big pivot, um, basically away from brokering and onwards towards teaching. I see. Um, you know, the big component for us is we discovered that – People want to get outside. They're looking for outdoor adventure, but they don't actually pull the plug and hmm. you know pull the trigger and actually go forth with it. Right. And the biggest reason why they don't do that is an emotional blocker deep down inside. Be it uh, they don't know how their kids are going to react in a situation, or they don't know you know where to use the restroom, or they're afraid of bugs, or whatever the reason is. So this is something that and, you didn't exactly uh, appreciate going into it, right? Right, exactly. Okay, so what is that? So how did that affect your idea of of pivoting? Because you know you started initially with, hey, I'm going to pull together all the best guides and and be this brokerage kind of connection service, right? Right, exactly. So how did so how did that how did you discover that maybe that was not quite the right direction or channel or you know? Well, it, we realized that the uh, market out there that nine out of ten people who searched for an outdoor adventure weren't weren't booking one and we assumed that providing them with easy access to vetted uh and really amazing guides um would uh you know assuage those fears i see that people had and it you know we put our name behind it we put a hundred percent money back guarantee behind it and that that would overcome their fear of booking this trip because originally the assumption was we're afraid to do this because we don't know the value we're going to get out of it because it's so expensive. You know, the average cost for a private outdoor adventure, you know, ranges from $300 to up to a thousand dollars per experience. And, and so that was kind of the underlying assumption. And what we learned is we were able to tap into the market of those who weren't buying outdoor adventure, but not to the extent that we thought. And so we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and take a hard look at our major assumptions and realize, mm-hmm. okay, we're making progress here. Right. We can eventually get there, but something's still not right. And it's by digging through uh, that question that we, you know, and to be honest, talking to a ton of our customers right. and our potential customers who weren't buying mm-hmm. that we realize, you know, the underlying emotional blockers that each and every person has towards getting outdoors. Right, and I like the way you you break that down too, because uh, not every um, you know business owner, business person has that kind of understanding of psychology that you really need to have, and you know, listening to your customer, right? Really trying to understand where they're coming from, identify who they are, like who are your users, and why do they want to use your service? It's so important, and this is like it, this describes just an incredible you know entrepreneurial journey that if you haven't dove into this lane before. Um, you learn very quickly, like you said, a lot of failures initially. So, and, and speaking about that, you know, I'm interested in, in how you got into it and why you got into it. Maybe we can rewind a little bit and talk about, you know, your experience in the corporate world and what your background was and how you thought, hmm, here's a, uh, a you know, pivot point in your life of, you know, you had to make a decision of whether to kind of stay in the corporate route or or kind of move, move into more of a, a passion play or maybe something that, uh, like you said before, you got trained in school to do, but just never executed on before. So let's talk a little bit about that, kind of rewind a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, at the onset, uh, prior to starting iTrekkers, I was working for Capital One hmm. uh, in Richmond, Virginia. And, you know, you talk about the psychology of the customer. That's kind of where I, I learned that craft I see. Um, by, you know, I, I led the analysis team that um, basically – tried to understand our, our customer and how they spent on their credit card 
um, and how um, what they liked about their servicing. So my, you know, I was in charge of the customer servicing analytics group for all of U.S. Card uh, domestic. I see. The way that they used to do uh, their analysis is they would focus on the bad things they were doing, and they would figure out ways to do those better, and they would take that and basically bring the information down to the call centers themselves. And what I realized was, you know, people are always going to be upset and we're focusing on mm -hmm. all this, you know, negative stuff. Have we ever taken a hard look at what the positive things people are saying about us and what the data is showing there and really understand not only the qualitative, I'm sorry, the quantitative aspect of things, which Capital One was very, very quantitative, right. but also bring in the qualitative aspect of things by understanding what it is they're telling us. And you know, the great news about, you know, the great, the great thing about a credit card company is they have so much data from right. so many customer surveys. And so we were able to, you know, dissect what our customers were telling us we did great and then actually up train all of the call centers on those facets of things. Wow. I really, I really, and that's how we were able to just bring, you know, to light the new customer aspect, uh, into the business. And so I was doing that and then I, you know, Part of the, you know, climbing up the ladder was, hey, you need to go into ops and actually run a call center. And I said, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and they said, well, you know, we've got an, an opportunity in Tampa. And that's how I ended up in Tampa was, was I came down here to actually run a call center. Right. Um, which for those who haven't done that before, uh, it's challenging, interesting, fun, uh, but at the same time, wasn't really right for me. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, we did a lot of great things, but uh, a year later, they asked me to go back to Richmond, and I just moved here with my two kids uh, at the time, Olivia and Emily, uh, and my wife. And I was like, you know what, I'm not moving again. Hmm. Um, at which point, you know, they were really generous and gave me a nice package and took care of me with a little side job for six months. And that's when I started thinking to myself, you know, what it is, what is it that I really want to do? Right. Uh, and right. that's how, you know, the beginnings of the journey occurred. I see. So you know, let's let's talk about that a little bit because I think that's a lot of people go through those those moments in their career where they might you know go through a layoff or they you know in this case it wasn't a layoff it was just you know someone you wanted they wanted you to move back to a location you didn't want to move to again, but it gives you this pause and you have this decision to make of well do I jump right back into a similar job because you're you know maybe you're nervous or maybe you really need the income etc. or do you you know, come up for air for a minute and, and take a, take a break and think about, yeah, what's direction do I really want to go in? I mean, did you feel like an urgency to get another job right away? Or, you know, where, where was your head at that point when you made the decision? Well, I'm not going to go back to, to Virginia or back to that job and knowing that they were going to let you go, you know, you know, the, um, I was very confused and conflicted. So, right. uh, a lot of those around me were telling me, you know, you need to get, get a job. And so, you right. know, I was new to Tampa, didn't have any connections, mm -hmm. trying to find a job here in Tampa that would interest me and kind of help drive me, if you will. Right. Cause I need that personally in my life. Um, that kind of challenge, uh, sure. to motivate me. Sure. And you know, like everything I was seeing, nothing seemed interesting. <laughs> they all seemed That's boring. It all seemed unchallenging. Right. Uh, jobs that I thought were challenging. Uh, I wasn't even getting called in for an interview because that's not how Tampa works. Hmm. Uh, it's who you know. I see. Uh, here. Very really interesting. Matters. That kind of opens the doors. And so, you know, the more I searched, the more disinterested I got and the more self-reflection I started having around you know, if none of this is what I want to do, then what is it that I want to do? Right, right. Um, and I've always loved the outdoors. I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly, incredibly passionate about the outdoors and conservation. And, um, and I've had this idea kind of percolating in the back of my mind for quite a long time about, hey, you know, if it's hard for me, how can we make it easier for others? And how, right. you know, society's moving in the, uh, the opposite direction of the outdoors as we become more sedentary and on our phones and mm -hmm. kids are growing up in a different world and totally, you know, all of that driving me to the point where, you know, I really think I've got an idea here that is relevant, that solves a problem and it kind of matches my passion with my job. 
Mm-hmm. And yes, it's a huge risk, but if not now, when am I ever going to do this? Right. Um, you know, I'd had past ideas that I didn't do that became companies elsewhere. Um, not to say that I would have been successful at it, but just to say that, you know, I, I, I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit. It runs in my family. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, just that nagging fight in my brain until more and more I stopped searching and started working on my own business. And, um, Wow, you know that 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 for me was that switch, right? I mean that that's a, I mean that is an emotional journey. You know what I mean <laughs> at this point in your life, especially because, I mean you have some small children, right? Yeah, yeah. So my wife Kara, and then um, my daughter Olivia, who's now eight, Emily, mm-hmm. who's now six, and Theo, who will turn two uh, end of December. Oh, another one. Okay, I thought I only heard about the two girls. Okay, wow. So yeah, you could say that it's an emotional journey. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and, you know, you're putting uh, potentially the the future, your own future at risk. Right. Uh, right. The way that you live your life at risk in order to pursue a passion or a love. Definitely hard conversations with my wife and family and, and whatnot. Oh, certainly. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's right. It's, it's a challenge within yourself to kind of get yourself to that point or to move through the fear or nervousness or angst to, about it. But then, yeah, then you have to bring your family along with this, on, with, with you on this journey if you're, if you're <laughs> interested in taking it. So, yeah, that, that's pretty, um, pretty interesting to me just to hear because it's, you know, you know, like a mid-career person just really making this switch is is cool. And I think that these days, what's interesting about it to me is that with the leverage of the internet and technologies, you know, it's a little bit closer. I can see more people being interested in doing this. And I think on one at one on one side of it is the risk part, uh, but the other side is you know the traditional job or the traditional companies are changing so much and so fast that. I think you have to be out in front, and if you're out there creating your own opportunities, it's actually a much less riskier path to to go down versus, well, I hope this company stays in business, you know, or I hope, so, or hope Amazon Amazon doesn't take over this sector of the market, whatever it might be, you know. Yeah, it's, you know, what you're saying has a lot of truth to it. What I learned in corporate America is that no matter if those around you support you within your company, Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're just a number. That's right. You know, we like to talk about culture. We like to talk about uh, value and people are the most important. But at the end of the the day, if the P&L is not balancing, there's a very easy way to do that. And that's that's to slash a bunch of people. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, gone is the, ooh, we care. And, and hello is the reality of, you know, employee number five, three, four, nine, two. That's right. Uh, yeah. Is that is added to the mix. So when you run your own company and you have your fate in your hands, it is incredibly difficult to be successful and you're going to fail a lot. But at least you have control over or some control over what your path is. Right. And and it's about enjoying the the, the journey, the process of it anyways, you know, because it's if you didn't enjoy the process and didn't think that this was fun or interesting, you know, you would, you just wouldn't have the motivation to get up and do it every day. So, and that's a better space to be in, in life, just enjoying every day as you go, you know, just like you said, that's what motivates you to be in the outdoor space and, and, and get out, get outdoors more. So let me ask you a question in terms of the, what you're feeling about technology or maybe like the, the greater population, the way you were thinking about it, because I know you, you said you grew up in, uh, you, you were born in France or, and you moved around a little bit, but then you grew up a little bit there that's giving you kind of a different perspective of lifestyles of, you know, what the U.S. is about or what other areas are about because you lived down in, in um, I think it was Costa Rica you mentioned. So maybe maybe talk a little bit about your different perspective in terms of work and technology and how you're feeling about it and how the value of what you're creating with eye trackers is really going to help a lot more people going forward? Yeah, that's a great question. You, you know, I'm, I've been lucky that uh, I've traveled and lived uh, in multiple countries. You know, I, I born in France, moved to the U.S. when I was, a, you know, one, moved back to France when I was six uh, or seven, came back to the U.S. for high school, uh, went to Canada for undergrad hmm. uh, at, at McGill, McGill University, then, you know, one day quit corporate America after college and moved to Costa Rica 
to live an adventure and wow. and all of that has allowed me to kind of see numerous perspectives of different cultures. And the one thing about the US uh, that I found is we're pretty close minded to our own ideas and our own life. And it's a lot of me, 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 mm -hmm. uh, which is not a bad thing. And that drives definitely success uh, when you're focused on, you know, continuing to better yourself. But a lot of the other cultures uh, out there are focused on bettering the whole part of the community. So mm -hmm. that mentality about caring and bettering others helps in some of the decision making. So, you know, in the US, we don't even take all our vacation. You know, A, we only get two weeks of vacation a year for the most part. Right. Uh, if you get any at all in this new kind of pay to play uh, world, mm -hmm. uh, job world, if you will. Um, you know, where if you're not working, you're not getting paid, you, you know, whereas in Europe and, and the, you know, they get six to eight weeks vacation a year to disconnect and, and go back and and reconnect with themselves, their friends and families. And, you know, we're we've become kind of a weekend lifestyle here where, you know, we try to maximize everything we can on the weekend. And, right. You know, but doing that means we're we're still go, go, going. And, and you know, the week drives into the weekend and then before you know it it's monday and the rat race continues and we don't really take a second for ourselves to stop and think and and you know take that personal time that's necessary and that's where i'm coming from with regards to to the outdoor perspective you know the the we we've always been a an outdoor society uh mankind has from right. from the beginning you know mm -hmm. and the last 150 years we've became an indoor society uh, where now, you know, everything we do is inside this little house bubble. Right. Uh, and then the last, you know, 15 years, 30 years, it's gotten even worse with technology and, you know, our job used to be outside and now our jobs are gl glued to a desk and we're innovating ways to work more efficiently at our desk with a desk that raises, oh, you can stand up while working, <laughs> yeah, right. oh, you can pivot around and, right. you know, we're so excited by those innovations. But the reality is we're, we're, we're a sedentary society today and our bodies are not made for that. You know, our brains are not made for that and they're right. made to be stimulated and, and, and get a break and connect. And I'm, what I'm trying to bring to society is this connection back with mother nature, bringing people back to the, our roots, um, to really allow us to, to, to be better humans in general. You know, uh, it's, it's that simple and that complicated at the same time. <laughs> right. Well, uh, you said a mouthful right there. And uh, if you're listening out there, you know, rewind and play that back again because I'm just letting that sink in. It's it's so right on. And it just reminds you, like, you know, it, it kind of brings you into consciousness a little bit when you really hear what you just said and think, like, yeah, what are we doing to ourselves? What? Are, how are we designing our society you know, there's tons of opportunity and tons of interesting technologies and, you know, things are shifting around. But, you know, paying attention to the human condition and what human beings are good at and how we're designed to live and interact is very is very interesting to, to think about. And I think you're right. We need more of it. You know, I want to I want to circle back to one point you made about community. And I think this is this is kind of an a, a amazing point that I never really appreciated that much until I kind of just heard you talking about it just now. And that, you know, living in these other countries and thinking in different ways where the community is more important or, or the, you know, the other countries don't have the commercial opportunities of the United States. So it's, you know, it's a double-edged sword always. You know, there's, there's great things about the United States and, and you can be wildly successful here, but sometimes we get lost, up, lost in that. When you go to other countries, they're slower and it's more community-based and it's more nature-based um, because they don't have big industry there. And the community is more important and making those decisions. So you mentioned having that idea of community influencing the way you make decisions. Can you talk a little bit about that more, what you mean exactly by that or what the feeling is that, that comes across when you're thinking that way? Yeah. So for me, community is about belonging and it's about discussion. It's about open-mindedness mm -hmm. and it's about kind of creativity. Right for the whole and the sense of community today in America has really been hurt. I'll give you an, a, a simple example. How many of us actually know the names 
and family stories of every neighbor, you know, up to two houses down from us. Right. We don't. Mm-hmm. I, I know I don't. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I think we used to, but we, we're living differently now. and We think differently these days. We are. We're, we're living inside. Right. We're living on the go. We're living with our face in a phone, a tablet, or a computer. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, we walk our dog. We're staring at a screen. You know, our kids aren't allowed to play out front anymore because of the way our fear levels have risen since, you know, if one kid gets snatched in Seattle, every person in Florida is aware of it. Right. Yeah, with the 24-hour news cycles, right? Yeah, society hasn't gotten more dangerous. It's just the awareness has gotten such that it's changing how we live. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's a problem. So we are we are more disconnected from everyone around us than we were before. We are m- further away from everybody than we were before. Social media has done amazing things, but one thing it has not done well, you know, is bridge the verbal and physical communication gap. You know, 180 characters isn't enough to tell someone how we feel, but it's enough to scream at somebody. Right. It's not enough to drive a conversation, but it's enough to make a point when we don't care about anybody else's point. And for me, the sense of community in this country is, is, is a real loss. And what I'm trying to do with eye trekkers is bring that community back together, not only individually get us to reconnect with nature and those that we love around us by, by being more, engaged together in the outdoors, which gives us a platform to be away from our screens. Mm -hmm. But we also want to bring people who, uh, you know, of different backgrounds together in our new outdoor university that we've created where it's lesson based, class based events, very inexpensive and, 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 and very accessible to bring a variety of different people through kind of like a public space. Um, just just the other day, two people that met at one of our events are now dating. You know, right. they're 55 plus. They mm-hmm. never paddleboarded before a day in their life. We got them <laughs> outdoors. We connected them through that moment. They learned how to paddleboard side by side. And now they're dating. Right. That's awesome. It's got, it's got to be a great, yeah, a great feeling when, you, when you're really, you're providing value just on the surface level of obviously you're getting people outside getting them, you know, disconnected. You're just creating joy in them just on the surface of what you're doing, but then you're creating these other deeper connections. I mean, it's gotta be a great feeling at the end of the day, you know, it is. And and Jim, like, let me tell you a quick story. I I went to an underprivileged school, uh, two weeks ago to, to talk to the kids there Mm -hmm. about the outdoors and the importance of the outdoors. And, and it was also for kind of research. I wanted to understand what drives them and what gives them pleasure. I see. In the sense of what are the activities that they like to do? And what, I came out of that shocked. You know, average use of a cell phone daily was four hours a day. Right. Spent on their phones. Yep. They, they are enjoying to text. They are enjoying liking things. They are enjoying all that. But then I asked them a fundamental question. What was the greatest memory you created last week using social media? Not one person could answer that because there was no memory. There wasn't created. one, right? <laughs> there is no memory, long lasting impact created from a, a like on a post or anything like that. But then we started talking about the outdoors, and all of a sudden, a flood of memories started coming out of these kids about the time they went camping with their dad, or at the time that you know their mom took them to a, on a nature walk, or mm-hmm. and what was interesting to me is like all those memories that they had, like I asked them like, when don't you want more of that? Mm -hmm. And that's when it started hitting them. Like I need to spend probably less time on my phone and more time actually taking and going to a park with my friends and sitting down and talking instead of texting and chatting and whatever. And that's what we're trying to achieve holistically down the line. You know, our visions to create a 1 million man, woman and child army of outdoor advocates Mm -hmm. And by introducing them and reconnecting them to the outdoors and their loved ones or friends, families, et cetera, around them, 
we're going to create people who love the outdoors and care about the outdoors and participate more in the outdoors and in doing so creating a larger sense of community right well that's i mean that's incredible how did you get the idea to go to a school and and talk to children were you asked to go speak or you just wanted to create this opportunity for yourself kind of a dual thing like you said research but turning people on to what you're doing to, to, to nature there's a a local program here that gets business professionals to come talk and someone mm. had heard me talk at a networking event and just asked me if I'd do it. Oh, and I cool. didn't even hesitate. I said, what time is it and where? Right. Um, just because, you know, the, these kids don't, don't have as many opportunities. I mean, you know, we live in Florida. We're surrounded by beautiful nature. Right. You know, we're very fortunate that our climate is, is great that you know the water is great and it's right there the beaches and yet it's like with anything else people who live here locally don't actually enjoy what's around them right because it's like it's there right, right. you know it's kind of like living in new york city and never having gone to the world trade center which a lot haven't right yeah you don't necessarily act as a tourist in your own town you know you kind of just do your job or go to school or whatever it is and you you kind of forget, yeah, you could live, be living right by the beach and just never go to the beach because you just, well, it's always there. I'll go tomorrow, right? Exactly. <laughs> kind of attitude, right? That's interesting. Well, that's I think that's a great thing to, first of all, first of all, just to be open to these opportunities that come your way. I think it's awesome. Uh, and it's a great thing to do just kind of a, from a business kind of point of view of, yeah, go talk to people, see what people are really doing behaviorally and how the business or your vision might fit in with them or not fit in with them, you know, kind of listen to their pain points and such. But wow, what a powerful thing to pull out of those kids to make them realize, you know, think about really what, what is impactful to their life. You know, that's very interesting. I, I, I don't even know if uh, many parents do that to their own children, right? On a daily basis or weekly basis. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that, that's pretty incredible. Probably so, not. Yeah. That's a great takeaway of like, you know, go to that, go talk to your own children today, like right when they get home from school, you know, um, and see what they're, what's really impacting them or what they think about it, you know, because that's true. You know, you think about your own childhood, you know, you might, if you're really into technology, you might really think like, oh yes, that first time I got a computer or first time I got a video game, that was pretty cool. But when you start thinking about the larger things that really impacted you, it's probably not necessarily related to technology, you know, it's just sort right. of a, distraction that occupies your time and you know time is short you know we don't we're only here about you know 80 90 years and you know let's let's do something um, meaningful in that time versus just you know clicking likes on a phone that's a little bit <laughs> weird these days i think yeah and and, and jim I, you know just to be clear i'm not dissing technology i think technology has brought so much right. to our society right i just the pendulum has swung too far and it's time for us to help kids and more importantly parents swing it back right if kids aren't getting outdoors and aren't learning outdoor skills that we used to have as kids mm -hmm. um it's in part because of the kids are doing something else but it's usually because also the parents are not putting emphasis on that and on those experiences and that to me is where eye trackers using technology to disconnect people from technology and reconnect them to themselves and those around them and nature. That's where it's powerful. Right. You know, let's utilize what's out there to help spread the word and get people to get re reengaged. Yeah. Well, I'm on the same wavelength. I mean, my background's in technology, so that's what I do. That's what, I, what I've done. I really love the opportunities that it brings, but I'm, I'm feeling that same sort of angst. Uh, and that's kind of what the show is about in that, uh, we're going to need more ways and more easily accessible ways to disconnect going forward. I just see it coming. You know, we're going to probably get more into meditation, more into outdoor sports, more into nature. And we're going to need it. Like you said, some people don't naturally, maybe the way kids are being raised today, or maybe just human nature because of their jobs and such, they, they don't feel comfortable or they don't have that avenue to go and figure out how to get those experiences. And so that's, you know, that's where you come in with eye trackers to try to leverage, you know, leverage technology, figure out um, the interface and the way to connect people and the way to create experiences so that it is accessible. So, so let's talk a little bit more about the, the techno technology you were using behind when you first started eye trackers and how you're leveraging technology now in this pivot where you're 
creating more of a, a educational experience. So how did you how did you go about developing this whole business from the get go? Because you're not specifically a technology guy; you were more of a uh, a business person, you know, call center expertise, psych- psychology expertise of customers, customer service. How did you how did you get your team together? How did you pull that together? Uh, by making a ton of horrible mistakes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fair enough. So, fair enough. Right. Uh, let me elaborate. So, you know, as you said, like I, I'm not a technologist. Uh, I had an idea of what I wanted, mm-hmm. and I went and tried to find partners that were as excited by my idea as I was, uh, who I thought could deliver. Uh, but with a complete, you know, this is uh, one of my major mistakes. Uh, not understanding technology or trying to understand more about it in the beginning uh, cost me a, a, a ton of time and a ton of money um, right. because I was not getting the product that I wanted uh, for my customers. Mm-hmm. So that was major learning. Uh, you know, I, I finally, after two years, found the right technology and design partners. Um, right. And that's when we got to accelerate. You know, the idea had always been the same, um, but we just weren't delivering on it. Uh, and then once we started delivering on it, we saw our, our growth really kind of hit. Uh, and it was thanks to that growth that we really could understand uh, where we were missing the mark. Uh, so then, I we, see. you know, we, we went through uh, multiple iterations, uh, a scrum methodology process. Uh, until we came to the decision that you know we were we needed to do something different to realign with our mission and our vision. So now that you're re now that you're realigning, um, I guess how uh, is is it just happening now or like when did you start to decide hey we're gonna we're gonna change? It's a fairly recent recent pivot. Yeah, so it's it's a recent pivot in its execution. Uh, but in February of this year, mm-hmm. uh, we sat down with our, with our leadership team and we said, guys, we're missing the mark here. Our yeah. cost of acquisition remains too high. Yes, yeah. it's dropping. Yes, it's improving, but we need to throw everything and, and the ki- the kitchen sink at it. Right. Uh, and we've got six months to execute this and get where we need to be. Uh, or we're going to have to make some massive changes or shut down the company. I mean, you know, it was that, it was that real. Right. Um, and so we went on a two day strategy session. We created the plan, you know, optimizing everything from the cart, the messaging to the design elements to mm-hmm. our SEO strategy. I mean, we we did it all. <laughs> right. And, and there's a lot of there. moving parts, a lot of moving parts, and, especially these days to figure out on the technology side of what really works. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, we went through track track, you know, you name it, the traction channel. We did it, mm-hmm. you know, radio and um uh, different forms of advertising and street teams and and it just crazy you know affiliate marketing we you know we did all kinds of things right to test and learn and move and at the end of the day you know i realized that we had become a company that wasn't living its mission and vision Mm -hmm. um and i also realized that our customers no matter what we did that wasn't enough to move them over the edge and that's what led to the deep dive of really understanding what it is that actually drives them to get outdoors and what it is that's stopping them from getting outdoors. Right. And it's out of that and the ashes, I should say the ashes (laughs) of everything we had destroyed to get to where we were, um, that rose up, uh, this pivot, which was moving away from private booked trips that we were doing across the entire state of Florida with third party guides and instead creating the outdoor university concept that would allow us to teach outdoor skills in bite sized format for, you know, fractions of the cost. For example, like learn how to paddleboard for $10 a person that gets you a one hour instruction with an unbelievable certified guide instructor. Um, and then, you know, that opens the outdoors to you and then you want to do more. And so you do the next level course and the next level course. And then maybe you hear about the fishing and you want to go try that. And all of a sudden you're just growing and spending more time outdoors mm-hmm. without having to buy all the gear yourself and without having you know no knowledge about where to do it and how to do it. Um, and that's really opening the accessibility of the outdoors to those who want to do something but didn't know how. And so now we're finally accomplishing what we set out to do. I got you. Through this pivot. Yeah, can you can you maybe um, talk about or give me a few more examples of 
of what your offerings are? Because that's that's very interesting to me. I, my the thing that's in the in my mind when I hear you speak about it is that um, I think a lot of people have a passion and they start a business because of their you know an interest that they're really interested in, really passionate. They have this vision, but they're not necessarily good at putting it in the right package so people can consume it properly. And I think what you've finally gotten to is this point where, oh, I see what the right package is. The right package is this entry point, it's the right price point, it's the right experience package, little nugget, you know, that people can wrap their head around and actually come and buy from you. You know, I mean, that's that's so interesting. So maybe give me a few more examples of those offerings that's like, because I'm thinking like, hell yeah, I'm going to spend 10 bucks to learn how to paddleboard. I've never done it actually. And that's easy for me to do and it's not expensive. Of course I would try that. And and I'd probably try, if I like you, three, four, five other experiences because it's something I can digest. Yeah, it's something you can digest. It's something you can do on your own time. Yeah. Absolutely. So to, to answer your question, you're absolutely right. How you package what you're trying to achieve you know, for us, we were we were trying to sell fifty dollar paddleboard tours, which, mm-hmm. in the scheme of private outdoor adventure, uh, is really inexpensive. Yeah, and people weren't buying it; they weren't. And we've sold more introduction to paddleboard classes now than we've sold of all of the paddle tours uh, in in the last year. Right. Why? Because people weren't buying the paddle tours because they didn't want to look like fools. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to you know, not know how to do it and then, or get stuck out there on the two hour tour and not be able to make it back. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just that it was that simple. And so repackaging it by offering a $10 introduction to paddle for beginners, we're going to teach you how to fall. Right. Don't worry. We got you covered. (laughs) Right. Um, that changed everything. And then they do that. They do the $10 one. And then after that, they're like, you know what? I'd love to try the, you know, maybe a, a morning workout paddle or maybe a, uh, you know, a smaller tour to get my feet wet and all that. Well, then, you know what? We have that and that's $30 right. and people are buying that. So now they've dropped $40 on paddle and they're doing it over time, over multiple weekends. You know, maybe it's once a month or once every other month. Right. But they're experiencing it at their own pace at a price point that makes them comfortable and they're having an amazing time doing it. Yeah, that's that's great. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> I really do. I, I really think it's so important to really concentrate in terms of when you're starting a new business is figuring out what that right offering is that can, you can really engage people with. Because it's you know it's it's you have this vision, but not everybody is going to understand your vision or what you're trying to do until they have the experience. And if you can't get them to have the experience. You know, then you find yourself in that struggle, and maybe that's kind of what you, where you were, right? You're struggling, having trying to get them to have that experience. Once they have it, I'm sure you can be able, you're going to be able to grow that audience and grow them into other uh, experiences, and they're going to love it. Well, thanks. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. definitely the plan. Yeah, and it's working <laughs> for you sure. Know, man. So far, we we tested the new model in September. We saw some smoke, uh, and mm-hmm. now we've got a small fire going, and I look forward to creating a raging fire. In the next three months, right, so. right. Well, I was just going to ask you that. What's your what's your vision? Yeah, what's your vision now that you kind of feel like, hey, now you are getting some traction. You figure maybe like you crack the code a little bit of how to put these offerings together. So, what's your vision now in terms of growth or, or offerings? Like, well, what are your what are your what are your full offerings now? I guess like what kind of categories? You know, is it just water based stuff or is it hiking? Yeah, no. Uh, it's a great question. Today we do, uh, there's the fishing category. Okay. <laughs> how to fish. Okay. Uh, and then that kind of branches off into fishing on a boat or fishing on land. Gotcha. Uh, so we teach that. <clears throat> we have that curriculum. There's the how to paddle, obviously. Uh, there's the how to camp. Camping seems amazing, but is really complex in a lot of different ways. And yeah. so it's teaching people how to build a fire, how to maintain a fire, how to cook in the outdoors is a big one how to set up a tent, where to set up a tent, Mm -hmm. Uh, all of that. Uh, We're teaching people how to hike, uh, weight distribution in their packs and what they need to bring and, you know, the fauna and the life around. Um, So that's really neat. 
And then we've got a lot of other future activities lined up because every location has something specific to it, you know. So um, if we if we ever launch in Maryland, you know, how to go crabbing. It's something that's so simple and so fun to do. Right. And but people don't do it, you know, <laughs> right. as often as they'd like. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, how to mountain climb, how to, um, you know, snorkel, how to cycle, how to mountain bike, the, you know, every geographical region will have a plethora of activities that we can kind of move into and teach I see uh, the locals how to do to, to take more advantage of the amazing resources around them. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're, so you're thinking already kind of maybe franchising this out or how you would grow into different cities or different regions, let's say. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, you know, that's a must this, you know, we started in Tampa Bay with our private experiences. Then we expanded throughout the whole state of Florida. Mm-hmm. Now with this pivot, we're refocusing a test here in Tampa Bay, um, but it is all about growth and it is all about spreading that word. You know, right? I'm trying to get to a one million man, woman and child army, mm-hmm. and right now I'm about four thousand five hundred deep. So, you know, I've right. only got nine hundred ninety five thousand people to reach. Okay, <laughs> um, and I'm going to need a, bit, a couple more cities in order to do that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds it sounds like it. <laughs> Wow. Well, hopefully we'll get the word out with, with uh, the show a little bit, which is great. And uh, I know that people, uh, you know, people from around the world are listening to the show. Like I, I was just checking the stats on these things. Like there's people in Egypt and uh, New Zealand, like crazy uh, far off places. But uh, there's, I know there's a lot of people in Northeast Ohio listening to the show. And uh, today I think is the first day that we're actually going to get snow, they said. So it's, I think it's like 28 degrees out here. And I know a lot of people, especially coming up here in the wintertime, they head down to Florida, you know, and they're, they're going to be looking for these experiences. So hopefully we're going to be adding to the army when people hear this. I think it would be great. <laughs> I, that sounds great. Yeah, man. So um, we got a, we got a few minutes left here, but I wanted to ask you a couple questions before you get out of here. And one is talking about technology, and obviously you learned a ton in terms of um putting this kind of the marketing machine and the offerings together and have, having people find you, et cetera. But with all your business experience and your technology kind of knowledge and your idea to get people away from technology, what's, what's the one thing that, that still kind of gives you some pause about technology going forward? You know, aside from, yes, it's affecting us society, but is there like, you know, one small thing, big thing that's, that's really sort of like you still haven't quite understood or you're kind of gives you some angst. I think what gives me angst um, regarding technology is with the phone becoming as powerful as it is, Mm -hmm. we're now going to have to make conscious choices to disconnect. Right. And it's so easy to do to proximity. It's in our pocket to use our phone to lose ourself and instead of thinking um, that I'm worried about um, society's ability to handle problems or critical critically think about issues I think those are the two main things that that worry me the most about the direction that we're going with technology uh, you know in the past when you were waiting for your transportation you had nothing else to do but sit there and think right, right. Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, when you're going for a walk, you know, the, the phone was attached to your kitchen. So <laughs> right. you, you were able to walk the dog in peace and just kind of lose yourself in your own brain. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and less and less of that is happening today. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Some, it's something definitely to be more conscious of because it's, you know, you can kind of how you uh, – might like, uh, you know, binge eat while you're watching TV or something like that. Sometimes you can kind of just binge out on your phone or binge out on Facebook or whatever it might be. And, you know, that's, that's one way to disconnect, but it's, it's, it's affecting you. You know, you, we have to be uh, aware of what's going on. So my second question is, as, you, as we're going forward here, and you've already been able to do this quite a bit in terms of pivoting, but going forward, what's, what's one tip or two that you can give people out there that are listening uh, that are interested in reinventing themselves or creating their own business, you know, what, what's uh, a key thing that you come back to that helps you continue to reinvent yourself? Well, this is a tip for someone who wants to start out a business that they're passionate about 
the first thing I would say is go work in that field, right? While you're working on your plan, go get a job. Doesn't matter, you know, what it pays, but go get a job to learn the ins and outs of the industry that you want to pursue. I wish I had worked in a sports store, for example, mm-hmm. and talked to more people who are coming in to buy stuff. I see. a lot of people buy things that have no idea how to use it, but they're buying it because they want to. Right. And it just stays in their garage. Uh, <laughs> right. I wish I had done more on the digital marketing side to really understand, uh, you know, either through work or through reading and really understand what the what the world is about when it comes to digital marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've wasted so much time, effort and money um, pursuing things that had I tried to understand more and spent more of that upfront time to really dig into, uh, I, I would have realized it wasn't worth the effort at that point in time. Right. Um, and then I think finally surround yourself with people with different skills. So, as you're thinking through your idea and you're looking for partners and you know you're good at X, Y, or Z, uh, surround yourself with people who are good at the things that you're not good at. Right. Um, so that they can help prop up the cons uh, that will occur uh, as you go through your startup journey. Awesome. Oh, great, great advice. And um, yeah, I, I really am appreciating more and more in terms of like you said, listening, you know, finding that uh, job, and it could be just a small job like at a retail store or whatever, but something that's in the industry you're interested in and listening to customers, listening to that customer experience. I think it's really key to to understand why people buy and what they do with stuff when they buy it, you know. <laughs> Does it just sit at home? And then you can figure out um, how your offering might fit in. So awesome, Tom. Well, great to talk to you, man. Um, if people are interested in connecting with you and finding out more about eye trackers and uh, – um, you know, jumping in on one of those experiences with you, how do they, how does everybody get hold of you? Well, you know, you can always get a hold of us at itrekkers.com. That's I T R E K K E R S.com. Okay. Uh, you can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I mean, you know, we're, we're everywhere You're like everywhere. everybody else. Okay. Uh, and if you want to contact me direct, uh, itrekkers.com slash team, there's my information there. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, drop me an email. I'd love to continue this conversation. So. Yeah, very good. Yeah, reach out to him. And if you're going to Florida, you know, definitely check him out. And uh, Tom, it was great talking to you. Appreciate it. Hey, likewise, Jim. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. If you want to hear more, join our mailing list at Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution.com. See you next time. And remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of.